Hi everybody, this is James Tompkins and welcome to Understanding Net Present Value. And in this Understanding Finance Nugget, not only are we going to get into what net present value is, but we're also going to go a little bit deeper. So for example, if I tell you that the solution to a net present value problem is $10,000, well, what exactly does that mean? And also, what are the strengths and weaknesses inherent in this analysis. Now, before we get into this, it's going to be helpful for you to know what the asset investment decision is, because what does a net present value calculation typically apply to? Well, it applies to an asset investment decision, or what textbooks refer to as capital budgeting. And what's an asset investment decision? Well, essentially, it's what a company spends its money on. So, for example, when Apple decided to get into the Apple Watch, did they need to spend money on R&D guys and, and uh, maybe software engineers and suppliers and materials and so on and so forth? They did, right? So that's an example of an asset investment decision. And if you want a little bit more depth, obviously, you can look at the nugget. And also, um, assuming you have a good understanding of time value money, and then, of course, you can always go to the Corporate Finance Lecture Series playlist, where all of this stuff is in order. So what is net present value? Well, first of all, um, I'm assuming we know, quote unquote, the relevant cash flows and also the discount rate, which, of course, is provided or will be in other nuggets or the, the lecture series. But just to give you a quick sense, imagine that uh, I invest in my lemonade stand. Well, is that an asset investment decision? It is, right? So would I need to spend money on the lemonade stand? I would, right? So imagine I have to spend $10,000, and then every year, because of the lemonade stand, it produces, if you will, cash flows of 4000 and so on and so forth. And then, let's say after five years or five periods, whatever these are, uh, that's it. That's the end. And then the discount rate, what, what characteristic does that apply to in these cash flows? Well, let me ask you this. These cash flows, like this one right here, is that a guaranteed or is that an expected cash flow? Well, that's an expected cash flow, right? And so, is there any characteristic inherent in a, an expected cash flow that would, if you will, make you feel like it's more valuable versus less valuable? Well, what about its risk? So, for example, I'm going to draw you two expected cash flows of $4,000. All right, so both, both of these are expected cash flows of $4,000. But maybe in the case of one, I might get a little bit more money than expected. Or maybe in the case of the other, I might get a whole lot more money or a whole lot less money. So which of these two is more risky? This guy right here, right? That's the more risky run. So would that result in a higher discount rate or a lower discount rate? Well, that'd be a higher discount rate. So for example, if you lent money to someone and they said, hey, I'm going to take that money to Vegas. Well, would you require a high or low interest rate? A high interest rate, right? And an interest rate is a type of discount rate. So in any case, that's just a quick preview of the relevant cash flows and the discount rate. Like I said, there's a lot more depth on that stuff in, in my other lectures. And so what do you think net present value is? Well, from time value money, you know what present value is, right? Present value is just bringing, say, cash flows back to an earlier time period. So net present value, and I assume they call it net present values because they're basically going to take all of these future expected cash flows and they're going to net it with this initial initial time zero cash flow and that's what they're going to call the net present value. So if we calculate what net present value is or, or how to how to you know specifically calculate it, I'm putting all these numbers at time zero. So this minus ten thousand, would I need to do anything with that? I wouldn't, right? It's already at time zero. 
What about these guys right here? Now these four happen to be an annuity, which is a coincidence, but hey, it is what it is. So could I use my annuity formula? I could if I wanted to, and, and, and there it is. And, and you know, if I wanted to, I could bring each of these back and, using single cash flow principles. Either way, would you get the same answer? You would, right? And what about this 6,000 right there? Well, basically, I'd have to discount that five periods. And so I get a solution for 6,405. So that's how you calculate net present value. Now, if you want a little bit more depth and we get into exactly what it means, then stick around. But if, you, if you're just interested in, you know, how do I calculate it? Well, that's basically it. You bring all cash flows using time value money principles, including the initial one, back to time zero. So let me ask you this. Here we have 6405 as our net present value. So my question to you is, in theory, how much has firm value changed when the project is announced? Well, the answer is, is 6405. And we'll get into when, but we're also going to get into an assumption that's part of this. And, and, and that is this notion of efficient markets. I really have to say, you know, if I, if I assume that the change in firm value is, if you will, an efficient reaction or, or a reaction consistent with efficient markets, then, then firm value will have changed by 6405. So what do I mean by efficient markets? Well, is it fair to say that stock prices change with flows of information? It is, right? So imagine Apple announces the iWatch. Do you think when Apple announced the iWatch that the stock price of Apple changed? Well, it probably did, right? I mean, for example, and I've made up these numbers, here we have Apple's stock just chugging along, and, and imagine this is where they announce the Apple Watch. And it shoots from, say, 100 up to 110, and then it continues to chug along. So basically, there was a $10 change upon the announcement. Well, that change would be said to be efficiently priced. So the, the new $110 would be said to be efficiently priced if, if, number one, the change was immediate. So it didn't just kind of take its time in, in making its way up to $110. And number two, that change, that $10 change, was neither an overreaction nor an underreaction. Now, how do I know what an overreaction or an underreaction is? Well, I don't, right? Which is why no one can ever really prove that something's efficiently priced. But probably what's fair to say is if you take a company like IBM, which is traded on the New York Stock Exchange, would you expect that to be relatively more efficiently priced than, say, something on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange? You probably would, right? And so the first point to make is that, you know, this in theory, this firm value in theory would have gone up by 6405, assuming the markets are efficiently priced or it's reacting in an efficient way. But there's still a little bit more depth, right? And and the the additional depth is that the 6405, does it take into account the riskiness inherent in the cash flows? It does, right? I mean, what it's basically saying is, look, even after we account for risk, there's still, in a sense, a, a gain of 6,405. It's kind of like that Vegas example. I'm going to lend you money, and you're going to take it to Vegas, and I'm going to charge you, let's say, 20%, because that's just the, the fair rate given that risk. Well, if I got back 25% instead of 20%, that, that additional 5%, that, that'd be analogous to the, the MPV. You've, you, you've, you've gone above and beyond what is required for the level of risk. And so the discount rate reflects the riskiness of the project and its positive MPV, and that therefore suggests that value has been created or destroyed for the firm. Value has been created. By the way, just to give you one more sense for this discount rate, 
imagine, and, and there's really no such project that exists as far as I know, but imagine a project is riskless. Well, what would be the discount rate? Would it be zero? It wouldn't, right? Because probably the closest thing we have in real life to something that's riskless, in this, in this case it's an investment, would be maybe investing in a UST bill or some other government that is, is likely going to uh, pay back when they borrow money, pay back in a timely basis and, and the full amount. And so a UST bill, are those rates zero? They're not, right? So, so even when investors take on something that they perceive of as having no risk, they still are going to require a rate of return. Of course, yeah, I, I recognize that it depends where the rates are. Right now, they're pretty close to zero. So what should the decision rule be? Under what circumstance, when we look at this MPV, should we say, yeah, let's do it, or let's not do it? Well, very simply, obviously, if it's greater than zero, then are you creating or destroying value? You're creating value, right? At what time period are you creating value? Well, at time zero, right? Because this 6405, everything was brought back to time zero. If we get back to the Apple Watch example, when Apple announced the iWatch, had they sold even a single watch? They hadn't, right? They hadn't sold a single watch, but the market, at the time they announced it, they had an expectation of the cash flows that the Apple Watch would produce, the expected cash flows, and they, they, had, a, they had a sense of the riskness inherent in those cash flows, and even after adjusting for risk, in this example, the market will have reacted to reflect a change in firm value of 6405. And of course, if the solution is negative, then would you do it? No, you wouldn't, right? At least not with respect to what you quantify, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. An example, imagine IBM decides, hey, we're going to invest in the fish farm. We're going to get into the fish farming business. How do you think IBM stock price would react? Probably negatively, right? Because does IBM know how to operate fish farms? No. There'd be, there'd be inherent risk. There'd be risk inherent in the fish farm business, but then the expected cash flows would probably be pretty low because IBM doesn't really know what it's doing in that business. So for IBM, investing in fish farms would probably be negative MPV. Now, one more point I want to make, you know, this decision rule, is this based strictly on on what you quantify? Well, what does quantify mean? Well, quantify means putting stuff into numbers, right? So since this is in numbers, this is everything we put in numbers. So it's, it's very strictly on what we quantify. But when company makes decisions, are there also qualitative issues? In other words, stuff that's not in numbers? There are, right? And, and so what's more important, quantitative stuff or qualitative stuff? Or does it depend? Of course it depends, right? There's no magic rule or whatever that says one is more important than the other. The point is, you have to keep track of what you've quantified and what you haven't quantified. And guess what? In the end, in a decision-making under uncertainty world, you have to use judgment. So it's important to focus that, that this decision rule is based strictly on what we've quantified. So what are the advantages of this analysis? Well, number one, obviously, it adjusts for risk, right? You know, it considers time value money and risk. This is, this is, this in a sense, is the bottom line. This is, you know, is it value creating or destroying? And we're talking about right now, time zero, when it's announced. Again, assuming it's efficiently priced. And, and what are the disadvantages? Well, what two things do you need to calculate the net present value? Well, do you need expected cash flows and cash flows? You do, right? And what about the discount rate? You know, there's a number that reflects the riskiness inherent in those cash flows. Well, you need that also, right? And do you think those are always pretty easy to get? Well, it can be pretty tough. I mean, sometimes it can be easy. You know, 
I mean, if, if Intel d decides to invest in a new microchip, that's an example where, you know what, it's not going to be that difficult to figure out its discount rate. And, you know, I get into depth in that in my lecture series, if you, you know, if you want more detail on that. Um, but sometimes it can be really tough predicting, I mean, uh, calculating the discount rate and tough predicting the cash flows. And, and so that's, that's uh, a disadvantage of this technique. But bottom line is, if you can get it in the end, this is going to tell you, at least with respect to what you quantify, hey, is this a value creating or value destroying decision? Well, I hope this was useful to you and hope to see you in other nuggets or lectures and take care.